this is my first time in Prague. It's always nice to speak to new audiences. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is uh, uh, the first uh, time I've given this particular lecture, so maybe a little bit rough. Uh, there's no, uh, I don't know if there's even a clear thesis in what I want to speak to you about. It's uh, a series of uh, preoccupations I've had. Uh, Probably because this is the first time I've put this particular set of ideas together, it has a overly complex title. Uh, maybe in future versions of this lecture, it'll get a little simpler. Uh, so first, uh, uh, I'd like to explain the title a little bit. Uh, that's why I put it together in the way I did. Uh, I think uh, um, in the intro, uh, it was mentioned uh, I have a background in philosophy of math, and in this very, and I did this very early in my life, and uh, in the early studies uh, in in philosophy, uh, uh, pretty much it's uh, an obvious conclusion that uh, there is no such thing as reality uh, that we could point to as such, that we could prove is uh, somehow more real than anything else. And it's, it's somewhat counterintuitive you know, to uh, recognize that there's no such thing we can point to as the real world and prove as such. Uh, anybody who's studied uh, even a little bit of philosophy quickly understands the nature of this problem. Uh, but, and I think subsequently, as I got drawn more and more into the discipline of architecture, it struck me uh, you know, more and more uh, urgently as a kind of peculiarity of the architectural discipline that it maintains uh, an opposition between what we do as architects, as uh, speculators of possible versions of reality versus this problem we always think of as uh, what happens when uh, we then enter into the real world and we have to build it or whatever. Like, uh, and as an educator of architects uh, for 25 years, uh, this is the, uh, it, it becomes really funny just seeing students preoccupied with what it might mean to eventually enter into the real world, you know, but, uh, from the philosophical perspective, uh, the so-called real world is nothing more than one of those fictional worlds that became normal. You know? And anything that we would point to as being real or normal, all of it at some moment in time, historically, started out as somebody's crazy ideas. So as a general principle, uh, I want to uh, insist that uh, there is nothing other than fictional realities. And, uh, and some of these fictional realities uh, become part of what we call the normal world. And, and I think uh, this is uh, uh, what is kind of the astonishing and magnificent mission of architecture. I think it is absolutely the most powerful medium for constructing, broadcasting possible fictional realities. So that's that part of the title. Now, something a little more specific to my interest is, uh, it's almost the kind of uh, paranoia I've always had since I've started studying architecture, that there is a technological underground to the various fictional realities that we inhabit. And it's a technolo technological substrate, and there are, I think, many layers of technology underneath our feet and that uh, they become progressively more difficult to di detect and progressively more sublimated. So uh, I take it as part of my uh, interest and also almost a feeling of some kind of, I'm compelled to do this, to then mine that and to try to pull forward uh, what might be maybe uh, hidden layers of uh, technologies that influence uh, things that we don't think have anything to do with technology. So here's the first slide. Uh, I think you know what this image is. Uh, 
This was a photograph taken in, uh, I believe, 1968 uh, by one of the Apollo missions. Uh, it seems like an image that's always been with us, but uh, it wasn't until 1968 in the history of human civilization that we first saw what the planet looked like because we launched an object into space and photographed it. Uh, ecologists point to as this is probably uh, the moment where uh, the field of ecology begins. Just uh, the impact of having seen this image was uh, absolutely uh, ground changing. And uh, if uh, probably if I had asked all of you to close your eyes and imagine what the Earth looks like, it probably would be this picture. Now, what I'd like to point out to you, which is not an obvious influence of technology, is uh, this image that might be in your minds of the very planet we inhabit, the thing that seems maybe more than any other image, an image that is natural to us, it's nothing more than a memory of a photograph that you have seen. And f the photograph is a machine. That is, uh, the camera is a machine. But then again, what kind of machine was the Apollo space capsule? It was probably uh, the most spectacular display of technological power in our lifetimes. And this is how we got the image. Even though we think uh, it's just somehow we're, we're born with that picture, but it's nothing more than a picture you have seen. More specifically, a photograph you have seen. Okay. This is actually what the Earth looks like. It actually does not look like that picture. This is a footage that was quietly put together by NASA and also quietly released to the public. They have been recording images from space, from their satellites, for years. And finally, uh, it was released to the public. I was absolutely f stunned when I saw this video. Uh, the Earth does not look like the way you think it looks. I would like you to just observe the utter electrification of the entire surface. Not to mention the radiation then, that's them bouncing off of the atmosphere coming from the sun. But then uh, you have to notice uh, the still object in the video footage, which is the machine itself that's photographing this image. So as I've been uh, investigating technology in my various experiments over the years, uh, slowly I've been becoming more and more preoccupied with the problem of photography. As the, or photography understood as a mechanized production of images that come to replace our very own capacity to image. You may think you have a, a natural imagination, but in reality, I think what we all live with is a kind of sublimation of photographs we have seen. That uh, the, even our ability to imagine a picture begins to resemble the way a camera takes an image. Like one replaces the other. So the technological substrate that we call uh, mechanized image production has been completely absorbed into our consciousness. So what does this mean as technologies for imaging begin to change? Doesn't that mean, therefore, our very capacity to imagine also changes with the technology? Anyway. Uh, I've always found this pretty interesting. This is a, a photograph of Skylab. Uh, if you, it may seem pretty normal. Yes, we know we've launched things into space. There was a project called Skylab. But what it actually was was a decision to launch a building into space. Because more than a kind of mechanized, kind of minimum efficient capsule, this was actually the project of sending an inhabitable space into orbit. So it's essentially a house that was launched into space, which I, if you think of it that way, it's absolutely fantastic. 
Now, I've I've been interested for in num for a number of years in uh, like the solar panel. Uh, this is how uh, nerdy I can get with some of this stuff. Uh, I, I research for an uh, entire year just the technology of the production of the solar panel. And I, I got interested in it not only because we were entering into a kind of period of, in history of kind of ecological hysteria, uh, so it became a kind of important, meaningful technology to think about. But also I was interested in things like this, you know, like Skylab, because the solar panel was invented to make this mission possible, specifically for this mission. Uh, and once you begin to understand how a solar panel actually works, I mean, you can almost be proud of human civilization that's just absolutely incredible just how clever this device is. So you would expect then, as these kind of technologies filter down to us in architecture, that uh, we would likewise have uh, astonishing architecture on the ground too. But this is, this is the kind of stuff that happens, of course. Yeah. And this kind of tragically banal kind of uh, influence uh, of architecture on technology, I find fascinating. What you see right away is, uh, I could draw no other conclusion that the, the uh, responsibility or the expectation of architecture is something very contrary to what was possible in the technology itself. So what I read here is whereas the technology was beginning to open up another possible reality, and if you recall, I. I conclude that all realities are essentially fictional until they become real, so to speak. But the mission of uh, the architecture is to go against that. That is uh, clearly uh, the responsibility of the representation of the house is to actually send a message to the beholder that nothing has changed that things are familiar, things are still f uh, familiar in history, that our location relative to time is stable and so on, all of which is absolutely false uh, once you realize uh, maybe miles above this height is, are these other objects that are now circling it. It's, it's no longer the 19th century for sure, you know, but it's strange that architecture expected to communicate this kind of idea of timelessness and stability, which is pure fiction at the same time. So I became very interested in this kind of conflict between, say, the responsibility of architecture with worlds that are becoming possible through technology. So this is still a bit of an intro. So this is very old work that I'm quickly just flipping through. Uh, it started out, uh, uh, most of the early work was uh, very interested in computation and digital fabrication. Uh, there was a time in uh, the mid-90s when laser cutting metal was still amazing. You know, it, now it's like uh, using a hammer, I suppose. Yeah, and so a lot of uh, the early work uh, was uh, interested in seeing uh, what forms could be produced in the real with uh, just the most exotic, powerful technologies I could get my hand on. Anyway, so uh, we reached a kind of, uh, I don't know, moment where uh, I don't know if it was so much a, a feeling like a dead end, but more uh, the interest started moving away from, I suppose, uh, problems of form to problems of image. So uh, maybe uh, 12 years ago, we are looking at books like this. Uh, I, I was also very interested in maybe correlating very new stuff with old stuff. Uh, we were reading contemporary mathematics journals, and also this very old book uh, on cataloging knots and looking at typo 
topology, playing with weird software for calculating uh, complex topological conditions and yeah, but anyway, uh, at some moment uh, it felt like uh, um, there was some other problem of technology that wasn't just about you deploying technology to produce form. And that slowly started becoming uh, what I call a problem of uh, image making. So uh, moving on to something very different, I promise you this will uh, be, uh, be related eventually, but it may not be obvious why. I think uh, uh, when I say uh, we inhabit fictional realities, it's not, I'm not saying anything too much more esoteric than phenomena like this that we're all kind of transfixed by in the world. And uh, I'm coming here from the United States where I ha this is uh, in my face every day, you know, this kind of absurdity. Or, or maybe a, a better way to put it is this kind of theatricality. Right. Or this kind of, uh, this type of fiction making is uh, becoming uh, a very normal uh, mechanism of politics today. Now, you may, uh, uh, and I don't think that's a hard thing for me to convince anybody of, that there's something deeply fictional about the current state of politics. But the thing that uh, you also know that maybe you haven't spent enough time thinking about is the role that technology is playing in these events. Uh, you may have heard that uh, uh, there probably was a fairly profound influence of social media on recent uh, political campaigns. There are more obscure uh, events uh, that may not be as well known to you. Uh, such as uh, the demonstration uh, by white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, this uh, was uh, surprising, uh, how well organized this event was and what a strong impact it was. Uh, it caught everybody by surprise. And uh, uh, I came across a... Uh, 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 this article by somebody who was doing some research on how this event was planned. And this reporter uh, had, uh, I guess you would say, embedded himself into the private communications uh, platform that uh, these protesters were using to organize this. It turned out what uh, they were using was uh, this chat service that was prim that's used primarily for people who play video games. And uh, the site is called Discord. Uh, some of you might, some of the younger people here might know it and have even used it. But a channel was actually set up on Discord for uh, this group. And, uh, and the premise was uh, no one's going to pay attention. No one's going to think that using a video game server for communication will be where the next uh, white supremacist rally is going to be organized. Now, one analyst made, I thought, a pretty smart observation that, uh, and of course, after this event, and this was published in the New York Times, uh, that channel was promptly shut down. All the people who were using it were banned. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what to make of that. You know, it's not clear what kind of policies are will turn out to be the right one in the future with problems like this. But my my interest in this is uh, again there was a technological substrate to these political events because as uh, was commented in the New York Times, what's what's odd about this is a lot of these communications uh, infrastructures like. Discord or Facebook or Twitter. And we've all heard about how we're beginning to discover the kind of profound effects that social media is having on contemporary politics, things that affect all of our lives. But uh, if, uh, for example, uh, all of these uh, freely accessible or uh, extremely inexpensive or in some cases completely free communications platforms like Discord 
were suddenly all gone tomorrow. Constituencies like those that organize themselves in Charlottesville, Virginia, would simply not be able to communicate with each other because they do not have the financial resources to mobilize for that. I mean, if you think about this for a second, it, it's really difficult to escape the conclusion that a lot of uh, uh, the recent events that we're seeing in a new kind of politics emerging of micro constituencies and how it's beginning to put pressure on our older systems of governance are actually an extension of all of these technologies that we're celebrating. That is having a fairly profound influence on our culture. There is a technological substrata of our fictional realities, hence my title. So I'm, I'm going to continue with a few points to try to think through this because this is something I'm struggling to try to understand myself. And today, I'm, mostly I just want to share with you some of the observations uh, I've been making recently relative to these things. So uh, there's going to be four points here. The first uh, I call minority reports. Now, uh, this, uh, this is kind of a seemingly a fun research project I did recently, but I engaged in this primarily to try to understand uh, some of these things. I asked uh, a number of uh, the postgraduate students uh, at SciArc to research uh, existing subcultures today. You may have heard of some of these, uh, and some of these you, you may not have. Uh, this one particularly is just hilarious. Uh, uh, this, uh, so I asked the, uh, the student researchers to gather information uh, in kind of uh, three categories. Uh, so what does the individual look like in the, that subculture? What are their equipment? That is, what do you need to buy or own and use to be part of it? And then finally, uh, how do they self-identify? That is, a uh, what are their representations? What kind of images uh, are associated with that group? So uh, this is a funny group uh, that uh, has come to be known as the health goth. Uh, it's like any other goth, kind of wearing all black, melancholy, always thinking about death, but with one uh, twist, uh, they like to exercise and stay healthy. It really is funny. I'm so glad you're laughing because I couldn't stop laughing when they showed me this. Sea punk, uh, which is a kind of strange subculture built around the aesthetics of uh, Sea World and Aqua Life. Uh, there are certain colors and certain stories. Normcore. Uh, this one has a funny story. Uh, uh, there, it's a group uh, that call themselves K-Hole uh, right now. Uh, four, uh, no, three, no, four uh, young, very smart Brown University graduates from fine arts were hanging out, living in Brooklyn, living the hipster life, trying to make art. One day they came across. Uh, a corporate trend report, trying to predict what young people would be into in the future. They thought it was the most ludicrous, most hilarious thing they've ever read. So they decided for their next gallery show to write a fake one, where they predicted out of the uh, fatigue of trying to be unique, and the endless uh, labor of trying to find the most obscure vinyl album that, uh, and the most artisanal uh, locally sourced food and clothing, out of sheer exhaustion of trying to be different, the next big thing will be trying to be normal and to fit in. And then they spelled out all the kind of products people would be starting to wear, like a kind of normal clothing, like like uh, V-neck sweaters, like I'm wearing it. And uh, it absolutely blew up, 
and went viral. Uh, it was taken utterly seriously and became a thing. Later, when uh, it was observed how big it had become, and now people were actually dressing like this and living like this, that uh, American Apparel thought, hmm, that, that was interesting, and then hired them to actually forecast more. Can you do norm core again? What's next? And now they're a legit trend reporting company. Very, very odd. Yeah, and it goes on. I mean, uh, there's quite a few slides here. I mean, it almost merits like publishing a small book, I think. Yeah, this one's really something, huh? And there's more, yeah. Now, here, here's the, the maybe a slightly more serious conclusion I draw from this. Uh, something I see as a consistency is just like I mentioned about uh, the political events being organized on unexpected uh, uh, platforms, technological platforms. None of these subcultures would be able to self-organize and exist without the internet, without Google, without Facebook, without Amazon, where you can buy shit, without credit card data, without corporations being able to uh, capitalize on, on purchase data fast enough. So it also depends on manufacturing. It depends on supply chains. So, one, and, and this is the scary uh, possibility that even though we thought technology uh, was the, the force that would unify disparate interests, uh, the kind of uh, dream of the, the third way or the technocratic state, that technology is the way forward to utopia and this is, technology is the thing that brings us together that opens up the future where we end up together. Uh, it may be the very opposite of that. Technology might be the force that is progressively splintering groups into subgroups because uh, it's, it's a kind of obvious conclusion to make, I think, because technology right now, probably the most uh, uh, profound kind of technology is technologies of communication or so what we call social media. Probably every single person in this room has a phone in their pocket. Probably half of you are, have been already checking things on your phone since I've been speaking. You know? I know this talk is gonna get recorded and placed on YouTube. I, I have eight other talks floating around on YouTube. Right? Everything is somehow seemingly available to us and uh, all we have to do is uh, click like and find other people that click like with us, and that's our constituency. So isn't it obvious that what this ends up promoting is a progressive splintering into smaller and smaller bits? Right? And what does our world look like at that point, I wonder? All of those uh, the subcultures that I showed too are they construct themselves through images. And in many ways, all of these uh, individuals like, just take a look here or here, they're kind of living collages, if you will. But it's a kind of seamless collage too. And that's my next point, uh, about seamless collage. Uh, this is more or less what we think collage looks like. This is uh, the famous one by Richard Hamilton in 1956. And we have versions in architecture also that we celebrate, uh, like Super Studio or early Ram Kohlhaas. But uh, I don't know if you've ever spent any time looking into the history of uh, the word collage itself, what problems it was trying to solve, why it emerges with the appearance of the camera 
and how it might still be operating today. These are all things that I became curious about. This is almost a kind of sequence of thinking too, like one thing leading to another. So at this moment, I started after this research into subcultures that I asked my students to engage in. I became interested in doing a little, maybe scholarship about uh, the history of collage. So some of you, I'm sure, know this quite well. We have uh, two moments that uh, most art historians point to in Cubism, which is generally recognized as the kind of cataclysmic moment in art history of the 20th century. On the left, you have a kind of typical, uh, what the art historian would call analytical cubism. So you have an object, uh, it could be a person. You look at it from this side, that side, that side, that side, and hence it's analytical because you're breaking down the object into all of these finer and finer views, right? And somehow it's being analyzed into these images, collection of images. On the right-hand side, you have uh, what the art historian will call synthetic cubism. Keep in mind, these two periods are separated only by about two years. So the one on the left, the portrait of Ambrose Villard uh, by Picasso, that was 1910. And the painting on the right, still life with chair caning, is 1912, only two years later. Now, something odd happens uh, in the synthetic cubism it has virtually nothing to do with the pre previous uh, experiment with visuality. Uh, Picasso starts doing something weird. He starts gluing stuff onto the painting, like the chair caning, the image of chair caning, or newsprint, or a piece of rope just literally glued to it. It's almost like uh, there's a kind of dissatisfaction with all the images a thing can make that getting deeper and deeper into the images of a thing is really leading to no deeper reality. Therefore, we'll just take things from reality and put, bring it into the painting, perhaps. So this is where this term collage really comes from, because uh, colère in French uh, is literally to paste, to glue. And to, sometimes it feels like uh, we're nothing more than a cut and paste culture but now we're cutting and pasting the seemingly infinite number of images available to us when we do a Google search. This is quite hilarious to me at moments. Uh, other times it makes me want to cry. Like I sit uh, talking to a student of architecture. Do you know the Farnsworth House? You don't even know what the Farnsworth House is? A moment like that happened in the 90s when my teacher would then send me into the dungeons of Avery Library and I'd have to find books. Xerox it, I would probably have to make change first, I'd have to bring the copies up to my drafting table, put down some mylar, start inking, and it's like a week-long thing to look up the reference. Now what happens? They just Google it right there on the spot, and seemingly millions of images of Farnsworth House start coming up. I think this is, uh, I, I think you can't draw any other conclusion that something fundamentally different will happen to the nature of the architectural imagination once we have a tool like Google Image Search. And that design uh, at times really might be nothing more than a version of coloring or collaging, gluing, cutting and pasting. David Hockney's uh, version of this is quite hilarious to me in 1982. Uh, and because you see, this is essentially both analytical and synthetic cubism. So you take literal Polaroid photographs of these objects, and they're obviously he's demonstrating his sly joke about cubism, because after all, you have a kind of guitar with a blue background on it. But uh, it is a photograph, it's a Polaroid, it's film. It's light that bent through an aperture that hit photosensitive emulsion, producing an object that's now being glued onto the canvas. It's, it's quite hilarious. Ironically, it was in the very same year that the artist Nancy Burson produced this 
uh, for lack of a better word, photograph. Uh, this photograph is called Warhead. What it is, is a seamless blending of uh, Ronald Reagan and Brezhnev's faces, but done in percentages equivalent to the nuclear stockpile of both countries, hence the term warhead. You know. The technology behind this was quite interesting because she was one of the first to start working with, uh, I guess, people studying the image algorithmically and was working with researchers at MIT on code that would eventually find their way into things like Photoshop. And it gave her, this new uh, digitization of the image gave her the ability to produce this seamless collage. I also don't know if collage is even the right word anymore because I don't know what it means that the two digital or digitized images are being glued together. You don't glue code together. Just for fun, I also uh, just threw Nancy Burson's image up onto Google and tried to see what the convolutional neural net operating behind the scenes of Google image search would find to be similar images. So the point I'm trying to make to you is uh, we all live with this every day. You're all living this. You're all using this. Photographs you've taken probably are already on the Google image search. You've contributed to it. What does it mean to be an author at this stage? This is uh, Andreas Gursky's uh, uh, print uh, called Montparnasse, Paris, 1993, now 10 years after the Nancy Burson. Uh, this is recognized as one of the great uh, early masterpieces of the Dusseldorf School of Photography. And it's a, it's a kind of monumental photographic print, this gigantic. What, what most people don't generally realize is Gursky was one of the very first photographers to completely embrace digital manipulation. So what you have here are actually three different medium format uh, images. They were taken on, on film, but immediately scanned and meticulously photoshopped, if you will, to produce a seamless uh, blend. This is uh, probably his most famous uh, photographic print. Uh, it's the photographic print that broke nearly every record on the art market for a sale of a photographic print at the time. I think it sold uh, for uh, something like 12 million. Uh, this one's called Rhine 2, and uh, it's what uh, he stared at all the time, every day. Except for one thing, uh, the Rhine doesn't actually look like this. It looks more like this. This was a kind of an odd practice of subtraction to some degree. I don't know, maybe you call it a reverse collage? I, don't know. I mean, do these words really make any sense? What does it mean to collage anymore? It's all happening digitally. Right. And Gursky uh, probably is the most kind of recognized practitioner of this kind of seamless collage today. But I see it happening all over visual culture today, uh, ranging from the fine arts also to ad uh, making, uh, not to mention uh, fake news and political campaigns. It's everywhere. In the United States, there's a continuing debate about whether or not uh, photographic evidence should cease to be miscible evidence because it's so easy to manipulate. What does it mean to make an image? I love uh, this, this picture. Uh, collaborative artists 
that call themselves the Glue Society came out with these images. What you're looking at is an aerial photograph of the parting of the Red Sea. Of course, uh, do I need to say there was no satellites circling the Earth at that time? Yeah. I don't think this is a kind of image we would have seen even 30 years ago. It's kind of seamlessness. How many times has this fictional story been represented in images over history? Many times. Right? Never like this. Never represented as a picture you might see on Google Earth. This one's my favorite. Uh, it's supposed to be Noah's Ark. This is uh, Clay Lipsky, who for years was photographing tourists from behind staring at things. At the same time, he had a kind of closet obsession with uh, requisitioning from the United States government photographic images of nuclear tests through the Freedom of Information Act until one day he decided to combine the two. I like this one, yeah. This is Cedric Del So, who takes uh, photographs of typical gritty, real, urban, abandoned scenes. Like, a, like, you see pictures of certain parts of the city, that's the real world, yeah. And then he photographs objects and characters from Star Wars into it. There's a lot of this stuff happening. For the past 10 years, uh, I've been teaching a representation course, and uh, I've been experimenting with this with my students. Some of the work from the students. This, is, this one's quite interesting. Kind of fake United States Geological Survey maps of places that don't exist. Little search of Los Angeles on Google after the big earthquake and a California falls into the ocean. This one's pretty good. Okay. Third point here. Uh, Heliography, photon detection, and signal distortion. Now, this is where I want to do a very close reading of what we mean by photography. On the left, you have traditional film. And uh, my colleague, uh, John May, who's an outstanding architectural theorist, recent article in a journal called Log points out that we probably should uh, be a little bit more precise about what we're calling a photograph. Using a photosensitive film uh, is quite literally heliography, sun drawing. It's light drawing onto a surface. It's quite literally the light from whatever source, like a, like a footprint imprinting a physical material. And this is why uh, traditionally you would expect to use it in a court of law because it's uh, kind of hard evidence of something touching something else. The event happened. On the right, uh, you have uh, kind of a standard photo sensor that's in all of our phones, that's in your digital cameras. I don't think there's many people in the world that takes uh, film-based photography anymore. Now, what we have on the left that we probably should uh, call heliography, as John Wayne points out, 
On the right, what we actually have is a photon detection. It's a device for detecting photons converted into a signal that then has to be processed by a microprocessor. Photon detection versus heliography. I, I find that a very interesting distinction. So then, if you're taking a digital photograph and photoshopping it or producing a seamless collage, isn't that like signal distortion at that point? Isn't that more accurate way of thinking about it than cutting and pasting or gluing? When everything is nothing but a signal, when images are at their root nothing more than a signal, what does it really mean to make a true image versus a fake image? They're all signals, ultimately, that can be processed. So this famous picture that I don't know how many times I've seen in books and architectural reviews, uh, like a kind of typical kind of uh, symbolic picture of uh, what an iceberg is, is actually not a real photograph. It's actually a composite of many different pictures. And it actually took some time to figure out how it was done. But it's not a real picture in the sense that actual light hit photographic emotion. It's not an event. It was constructed. But even if you go back to the very beginning of photography, this was always the strange potential of photography to produce uncertainty about reality. I'm going to show you a, a number of famous photographs that are generally accepted as uh, evidence of the real that are completely staged. This is a famous photograph from a battle, uh, aftermath of a Civil War battle in the United States. Uh, it's uh, not uh, widely known that this was staged. The bodies were actually stacked and composed for the, for the photographer. This famous uh, photograph, photograph of, uh, of it, this event in the middle of aerial warfare it's actually a burning balsa wood model, which was discovered much later. Probably the most famous uh, war picture of all time, this picture from the Spanish Civil War by Robert Capa, is still debated even to this day whether or not this is a real photograph or, a st or a staged photograph. This famous scene at, of uh, in Iwo Jima, uh, there's even a monument uh, copying this photograph in bronze in Washington, DC. It turns out the photographer uh, apparently saw this scene, but didn't have his camera ready. So he went back down the hill and asked the soldiers to come back up and pose in this way. Who knows what the actual event actually looked like, but this one of the most emblematic sim symbolic images from World War II, if you're an American, was a staged photograph. This famous scene from the 1960s, uh, the above photo was the one that was uh, initially published. Uh, the photographer thought it was unfortunate. Uh, he got the decisive moment, but uh, that damn fence post behind the woman made it look like a spear was going through her head. So he photoshopped that out. And then there was uh, a lot of uh, backlash and criticism about altering such an important photograph. And then they went back and started publishing the original again. So if you look for this image, you'll see both versions on Google. Again, with Google. Right? Ever think about what it what kind of crazy project Google engaged them when they decided we're going to photograph the world? All of it. I remember when I first read about this thing. Like, impossible. How could they possibly even store all that? Well, they've done it. Yeah. It's difficult to find places in the world where Google hasn't photographed it. Uh, and they use devices like this, uh, this kind of 360 spherical camera device that dynamically stitches and automatically uploads to their server 
pictures of everything, pictures of reality, okay, they used to say it was, if it was published in the New York Times, it's got to be true. I think our version of that in, at this moment in history is if it's on Google Earth, it's got to be real. Yeah? Now, the artist John Rathman's been doing a funny project. He found out that these devices automatically upload the images onto the server. So armed with a, probably a lot of Coca-Cola, he just sat in front of the computer, looking at places in the world, looking for freshly uploaded pictures. And he would screen grab those weird events that would be photographed, because the world's a pretty weird place. A lot of strange things happen. Ever notice uh, when you use Google Street View, you don't see anything weird. That's because they're edited out. But John Rathman would grab them before they got edited out. Things like robberies. Or just weird glitches. Yeah. I think it's in this kind of technological context for how we imagine reality that we see the intelligence and talent of artists like Gregory Crutzen, one of my favorite fine art photographers today. Uh, he's famous for these kind of uncanny scenes. He's been living with uh, the people of the small town for a long time, for nearly two decades. Occasionally, he'll ask one of the people, can I take your p picture? And they're pretty used to him, and sure, Gregory, you know, let's do it. So this is a woman that lives in this town. Doesn't it strike you as a little odd, you know? Why is the floor flooded? What's she looking at? You know? Where's that light coming from? That's because when Gregory Crutzen decides to photograph one of the people of this so-called real town, he then uh, does this. He builds an elaborate set, reproducing every detail, and then uses the most expensive, highest-end digital cameras and lights up the scene in this artificial way. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense relative to the type of image culture we live in. It's fascinating work. Right now at the SciArc Gallery, uh, I'm in the middle of trying to install uh, something I've been working on for the past year. Uh, I call this apophenia. What it is is uh, uh, an examination of uh, funny convergence in technologies of GIS, that is, of digital survey of the, of the Earth. I don't know if you know, like uh, you've probably seen like a uh, workers with the transit on tripod measuring things. That's not, that's not how GS collects data really anymore. It's primarily done through LIDAR scanners on unmanned drones that are constantly just combing the surface of the planet, producing massive unimaginable data about everything you, might, you would ever want to know about the terrain. Then is geotagged and correlated to incredible high resolution aerial photography from, from these machines circling our planet. So we, right now, I, I was ab absolutely floored when I started to get to know the extent to which the, the GIS field had advanced. The amount of data that's available to us that make possible things like Google Earth is absolutely mind boggling. At the same time, in computer graphics, our ability to simply model and render imaginary worlds have also gone through great leaps. But this was the thing that started to fascinate me. It's the very same technology for both. The very tools that you use to survey the Earth is the very same tools you would use to invent a possible Earth. So I think this has been a 
an interesting preoccupation we've had. We've, uh, this is a photograph from the Alpine Institute in Switzerland. I, I absolutely love that model. I, just the human desire to miniaturize the world for our contemplation is truly peculiar. Yeah. So this is uh, a kind of typical uh, screen capture from uh, processing of LiDAR data. And this is a kind of funny image of uh, kind of a probably straight out of a video game or a movie of an invented world. Right? So I've been uh, trying to develop a, it, I don't know if I would even call it a, a project yet, but experiments trying to manipulate both, both uh, the data that comes from GIS and the tools that are used in CG to produce kind of composite uh, world. So this is a, a fairly high resolution image of uh, many aerial photographs that have been seamlessly blended using uh, uh, some fairly esoteric computer coding. And then there's a whole set of other photographic prints, and I use the word photograph obviously very loosely here, because I could also say rendering, maybe that's more, or photoshopped image. And then there are the, all these scenes that we're making of, uh, uh, that presumably are from inside the world. And uh, we're also just having a lot of fun seeing what we could do with like matte painting techniques and just uh, producing kind of odd, peculiar, weird images of, uh, of landscapes. The base for this uh, came through uh, uh, some code we wrote to scrape data from the Google servers. So uh, we would download uh, approximately 20,000 by 20,000 pixel images cobbled together from tiny little tiles of calls to the Google database. And then uh, we would take these extreme high resolution files and start processing them and making composites. So all of these pictures are from uh, pictures that we've taken of uh, the planet, but then manipulated to turn into something else. We're producing uh, fun in these terrain models. Uh, uh, north of Los Angeles in Fillmore, California, there's this company called Solid Terrain Modeling. Uh, they produce very large uh, terrain models. And uh, they, they're, they're very interesting. They kind of tinkered with the machinery and came up with their own kind of almost garage device. And it's interesting, we're, we're already seeing a lot of different kinds of machines. This doesn't compare to the kind of advancement of, say, the machines that Michael was showing. But uh, it's, it's quite clever because uh, you got the kind of typical milling machine that we know really well. Uh, there's absolutely nothing special about this anymore. It's like a table saw. But uh, the technology behind uh, grabbing the data, the GIS data, is interesting. That then drives uh, the tool. But here's where some of the cleverness comes. They came up with their own uh, formula for being able to have essentially inkjet printer that you can spray onto the phone. So it's uh, like a kind of 2.5D sheet of paper. And they developed this because they had this idea that they could produce CNC inkjet printing. Now, what's interesting to me about this is uh, it's not really uh, so much a problem of producing a form, but it's more a problem of producing a three-dimensional photograph and printing it.
the last part of this uh, installation we're going to put in is uh, experiments we've been doing with uh, a company we've been working with recently, one of our clients actually, that's developing uh, a new kind of a artificial intelligence product. And uh, what we're doing is we're using convolutional neural nets to modify one image through what's detected as the stylistic features of a different image. So what you're seeing here is uh, uh, an aerial photograph of Los Angeles that was redrawn relative to an aerial photograph from Tibet. So like the freeway starts turning into mountains and you can see Dodger Stadium in there that starts looking like a boulder. Very odd, you know, and it's another version. Yeah. So I'm going to wrap up here by showing you uh, where, where this thinking uh, is taking us. So I'm, I want to show a big object and a small one to conclude here. Uh, this is a company that approached us about four years ago. They developed a proprietary technology for generating electricity from tidal changes. It's a pretty simple, elegant idea. You just have to find a hypertidal landscape where the sea floor remains constant for an extended length. Their idea was to simply build uh, an artificial lagoon that had a gate. And the gate would be opened and closed to produce variation in the water level. So the water would rush in and out based on the, the difference in water level, rushing in and out of gates where there would be turbines waiting for it to capture the kinetic energy and convert it to electricity. They also developed a way of storing this in hydrogen batteries. Then it could be transported to a power station. And it's an absolutely elegant uh, infrastructure that really becomes a kind of nearly endless supply of cheap energy. The construction of the artificial lagoon is quite straightforward. You stack geotextile tubes pumped with concrete, and then rocks just laid on top. Uh, this is not new. Um, this is stuff we already do all the time. Here's a picture from a typical stacking of geotextile tubes. We build very banal things with this method. But uh, it's quite a brilliant idea to turn this into a kind of machine for generating electricity. They nearly built the first one in Wales. But after a uh, community meeting, it completely fell apart. And uh, Wales, uh, the government of Wales decided they would rather build a nuclear power station. Yeah. Why would they do such a thing? Well, obviously, uh, well, and it was obvious from the meeting too, uh, you're not going to fuck up our nature. We don't want to look out on the ocean and see this machine. That, that was the basic problem. Whereas the nuclear power station, you can hide somewhere in the forest or outside the city. You can sublimate it, make it go away. So uh, they approached us asking us, uh, I thought, of pretty pr uh, profound question. They asked us, can you help us figure out how to make our technology more culturally acceptable? I said, yes, we can. Yeah. So for a number of years, we've just been producing a lot of images. Uh, like our, and based on all the other things I was talking to you about, our answer to them immediately at the very first meeting was, we're going to produce a, 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 a series of images for you of what the project will look like after it's built when people see it on Google Earth. The basic problem as we communicated to them is it just can't be understood as something that can be real. So it's really just a representation problem and we'll begin with that and you have your engineers so I don't think you need us to tell you how to engineer this. Anyway, so we produced a series of pictures. This was, uh, we identified a lot of different locations around the world and we are kind of uh, accelerating ahead to like version 10 of this. 
because the initial versions, which they're still trying to no negotiate this time with Scotland and Mexico, are going to be very modest versions of it. But uh, this is what we presented to them as where this can head. So the way we interpreted the problem was it shouldn't be such a clear distinction between what's a machine and what's natural, that it really should be fully a hybrid. And in the more complex, uh, I guess, form of this kind of half artificial, half natural assembly, you would also have to deal with other forms of variegation of the lagoons. And this is one of the funny things that came out of this, of having smaller lagoons nested inside the larger ones. And the engineers, are, they absolutely love the idea because they immediately realized that they could use the smaller lagoons to regulate the throughput of the entire facility. And it made uh, just the uh, kind of calculations for flow and current uh, much more interesting. But essentially, this is a 10 kilometer square construction that's essentially uh, an act of wiring up nature and turning it into a battery. This was a site in Alaska we were looking at with them. So then an existing, and then a new. This is the one they're trying to build now. We'll see where this goes. We've been talking to them for four years now. But uh, this was the project that began to start uh, uh, leading me to think that uh, I need to expand my idea of what it means to be an architect. Because clearly there's something I could contribute to them. And there's a way of thinking that uh, they don't seem to, that I could bring to this table that they didn't have. And uh, what, what do I call this, you know? Is, is this architecture? It led to, uh, to me being curious about working with other people that I might not have wanted to work with or even thought of doing so. So this is a small object. We call this the bioprinter. What we did was we collaborated with two biologists and a fabricator to produce this funny apparatus that printed uh, living, living flesh. Around that time, I was reading about Henrietta Lacks. Uh, she died in 1951 of uterine cancer. The doctor who took a tissue sample uh, had completely forgotten about this case. Henrietta Lacks never returned to the office and subsequently passed away. Almost a month later, the doctor recalled the appointment and went probably just to clean out the tissue sample, when to his astonishment, he discovered that the tissue sample was still subdividing. And it shouldn't have been. What he had stumbled upon was the first, and due to mutation due to cancer, was the first immortalized human cell culture. A lot of time goes by, and recently HBO made a documentary about the, the daughter of Henrietta Lacks that tried to investigate what, what happened here. Because uh, after, so let's say uh, 30, 40 years go by, and the Gila tissue culture is essentially the A4 paper of the medical laboratory. It's in every laboratory in the world. It's the typical uh, cell culture. You just mail order it when you do your genetic test. It turns out every HeLa cell culture that's now a global product in every hospital around the world all came cultured from the single tissue sample in 1951 from Henrietta Lacks. Hence HeLa, Henrietta Lacks. Yeah. It raised very strange questions for the children. One daughter asked, uh, so what, what 
does this mean? Does this mean my mom is still alive? Yeah. This, the older son just simply wanted to be paid royalties. But should he be? I mean, is it her property? Is it their property? What kind of medium is this? So after years of investigating digital fabrication techniques, strangely, I stumbled upon the thing that I never thought of was the nature of the medium itself. What, do we, what are we using to actually print? What are we doing to things to convert it into some generic medium that we can print on? That's something I became very interested in. Our first uh, thoughts were very naive. We thought, uh, we, we weren't really thinking that deeply about it. We just uh, were wondering what kind of forms can we make with this stuff? But very quickly, we realized that had, that was absolutely the wrong way to think about it. The problem was the medium itself. I ran into uh, these young people uh, that started a place called uh, GenSpace in Brooklyn. They call it a community laboratory. Almost like a gym, you pay a monthly membership fee and you can come do genetic testing. Yeah. I had to go and meet them after I read about them in the New York Times. I became friends with Oliver Medvedek. Uh, he's actually a senior TED fellow and so is Nina Tanden. Uh, Nina Tanden's PhD at Columbia was uh, incubating heart tissue, and she showed, you can actually look up YouTube videos of her work. Uh, in a Petri dish, you'll see it like a postage stamp size heart tissue wired up to a battery, to a current, and it's beating. It's absolutely spectacular. And uh, since we did this project with them, she's gone up to start a medical startup called EpiBone. Uh, she is producing a medical product of uh, bone grafts that have vasculature. And this might uh, save you uh, a hip one day. And this is my colleague at Pratt Institute, Richard Sorok, who was, uh, uh, before it became a kind of thing with MakerBot, he was producing his own kind of do-it-yourself 3D printers at the school. And it was very interesting. He was using printers to make parts for more printers, so there was kind of weird, almost self-replication. Yeah. yeah, it was a very interesting experience, training students of architecture and lab protocols. Here we are in gen space, just trying to figure out what we're going to do with this stuff. There's Nina pipetting the culture. This is the recipe that Nina wrote for us, the protocol for incubating immortalized uh, mouse cartilage tissue. Here's the first one that we successfully grew. And we had to feed it. We had to keep it disease free. What kind of paper is this? What kind of medium is this? You gotta feed it, keep it free of disease. One of them actually, despite our best efforts, got a fungal infection and died. And the needle that you saw in the machine was for depositing uh, bioluminescent uh, tissue onto this cartilage. It was just a very strange uh, investigation into just the nature of this medium. My students thought it was hilarious one day to monogram, uh, just made glow-in-the-dark, immortalized mouse cartilage with my initials with a smiley face. The last thing we were doing was, uh, before we moved on from this project, was we were looking into injecting it into aerogels to do, start doing this three-dimensionally. But the thing that was uh, really fascinating to me was all the different things that had to come together for this. So the focus ultimately wasn't on the machine itself, but in how the technology actually required all of these other pieces to coalesce around it. So 
So the final slides here. Uh, so this has opened up a, a, a lot of new territory for our practice, thinking about what it means to experiment and what the role of image and technology is in our field. Uh, so our current work right now is uh, I recently led a team of researchers uh, collaborating with PCA architects in Paris, Philippe Chambaretta. And this was for a competition sponsored by the Paris Mayor's Office. It's a half million square foot master plan southeast of Paris. And my team was primarily uh, uh, providing them with a, a strategy report for how to develop uh, the centerpiece of this master plan, which is the cultural incubator, which is uh, an abandoned railway shed. It's quite large. But a lot of the thinking that I presented to you today were filtered into what constituted a kind of urban design strategy for how to make this thing come alive. And last week, uh, they, we were notified that the team uh, was selected. So uh, after here, I'm going to be flying to Paris to see what happens now. Uh, we'll see. And our client currently in Los Angeles, uh, the one we, that's helping us make images right now, uh, they're producing a very new kind of uh, artificial intelligence product. Uh, they're, what they're pushing towards right now and raising capital for is for producing uh, virtual actors that will not be rigged to actors. You've probably seen those motion cap capture things. But rigged not to actors, but rigged to an AI database, fully autonomous. Uh, this is getting quite weird, everyone. That's uh, the work, technology is beginning to do strange things. Uh, but their technology is essentially for copying every behavioral feature of an actual living human being, and then turning it into a product. So, we've right now they're still in a kind of uh, capital campaign fundraising for this company. So. Eerily similar in some ways to our work with uh, Tidal Electric, we've been producing really nothing but images for their meetings with potential investors. Because uh, what we're eventually going to do is we're going to be designing their first facilities. And it's going to be a strange program because uh, this is probably the most banal part of this, their actual workspaces where they wanted virtual stuff. But uh, it's, it's also a kind of strange facility for inviting people, having them be in a certain state of mind, interviewing them, having people come to meet the virtual person. Right? So there's a kind of, uh, there's been funny discussions about having a reception area where a virtual assistant comes to meet them. They also want a kind of a high-end spa where somehow you can get people into the right frame of mind before the strange interview process. And they wanted the virtual version of the person under construction present during the interviews, which is also very strange. I mean, as, I'm tell as they're telling me these things, I, I almost can't believe what they're telling me. You know? It's a completely interior project because simultaneously they want something pretty low key on the outside, something anonymous, and, and that's the word they used. This is what they've been calling uh, the family room where you come to meet the, the virtualized person. We're primarily interested in the scanning facility uh, and their devi the device for full body motion capture is, it pretty much looks like this. And they want the kind of gallery surrounding it with all the other people that have been scanned. You know. So, so I'm, I'm very curious to see where these experiments go. You know. But uh, again, the title of this talk was the technological substrata of our fictional realities and 
hopefully I've uh, explained why I gave it that title, and thank you for listening. Thank you, David. Any questions? Oh, here, yep. I thank you so much for your presentation. There are so many thoughts here. It's uh, really difficult to uh, to react. Um, just one one observation when you were talking about I'm here distinction between heliography and uh, photography or digital photography. Um, I think this notion that photography is uh, neutral is just another narrative. Uh, all photography is always embedded in, in some kind of narrative uh, and it never is uh, neutral. And I think what is really interesting which is going to happen and what you're actually um, touching upon in, this, uh, in these last projects that you were showing is what happens when I'm here. Uh, when this here, <laughs> yeah, uh, what happens when uh, these digital technologies, um, these narratives, become embedded in, in shared computer systems? So either creating virtual 3D avatars or something completely different, which we actually don't know yet. Um, so we're seeing that computers are actually going to be networks of computers. They're going to build their own ecosystems. And uh, this is all going to move forward in, in completely unexpected directions. So this is just like an additional comment. It's not really an, a question. I mean, uh, I, I appreciate your comment. And I couldn't agree with you more. And I think, uh, um, I think just, uh, I mean, this event is uh, labeled experimental architecture. And I think uh, uh, what I thought experimental architecture was 10 years ago is different from what I think experimental architecture means today. And what I thought the problem of technology was 10 years ago, I think is the problem of technology looks very different to me today. You know, so I think uh, uh, I, I wanted to mention the possible way of thinking about contemporary politics because I think the stakes are quite high, you know? And I think it's a mistake to just ignore it and expect technology to, like f photographs, it's a mistake to think technology is totally neutral. 